views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. All right, welcome to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We have a big show today. Starting off, Rikers Island, it's a mess. Um, what are we going to do about it? Uh, we have a, a guest on, on air who hopefully is going to give us some guidance as to where we're heading. Uh, certainly something needs to be done. Uh, next up, human rights and domestic workers. They've been ignored for so long in our city, nannies, healthcare workers, uh, you name it. Um, finally, some, some justice for them and their ability to be able to um, be heard. And finally, last up, we're gonna talk about voting rights. There are those in this city that have not been able to vote. Um, now that they have legal permanent status, should they be able to vote? Well, it's an interesting issue, interesting topic. As you can see, we have much to get to. Stay tuned, today's verdict starts right now. All right, uh, welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We have with us today, Tony Herbert, and we're gonna discuss all things Rikers Island, which has been in disarray. Tony, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you guys for having me, I appreciate it. It's completely our pleasure. So, you know, Tony, Rikers Island has always been a problem. It's just always seems to be in the news. I've been there myself a few times to sign up clients who've gotten injured, you mm -hmm. know, I've, I've been on the barge, which isn't Rikers, but I've been, you know, to Rikers itself and walked around. Um, why now? What's in the news that's making you need to come on our show? Well, let, let's be very clear about something. Rikers Island isn't something that just happened just yesterday. Rikers Island has been an ongoing set of circumstances of neglect by administrations who basically have all co-signed with the idea that they want to close it. They want to close it because it's a land grab, meaning that they have um, have created an atmosphere to make it seem like the corrections officers are the bad guys and that the facility is in such disarray that they want to close it because they can find better use for it. But they use the corrections officers as the scapegoat and talk about the abuse and talk about the deplorable conditions. Let me, let me be very clear about something. These conditions were created not only by the, the tail end of the Bloomberg administration, um, where they did some work, but this de Blasio administration totally created its demise because at the end of the day, he had negotiated with a number of rich developers, which we know for a fact, because he put together this commission, this commission to go and do a study on Rikers Island. And on this commission, there were eight real estate developers. Why? Because we all knew what it was. It's a land grab. And... I'm under the impression, and, and I support the idea, that de Blasio should be brought up on criminal corruption charges because he did not allow for these jails to be open. And when we started to get the uptick in violence, he still didn't allow for them to open up the additional jails to accommodate the overflow of all of these uh, individuals that were coming into the system. He didn't provide you know, adequate space for them. This has created the atmosphere we're dealing with right now. So the Blasio is at fault for everything that has happened in Rikers Island. So, and now resources are being diverted, I think, to Rikers. In other words, police officers that would normally be patrolling the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side. Um, how is that going to work out? Has that been happening already? Well, it's, it's something that they're saying is, is, is to take place um, in the most immediate time frame. I don't know if the police have actually hit the court system yet where they're supposed to go and replace corrections officers who can be put back out into, you know, on the field, you know, where Rikers is. But let me let me say this. Policing and corrections are two different animals. And when it's all said and done, there's a different type of, of atmosphere that has to go in to maintain and or do uh, tier custody and control. When you talk about the police department, they've always been this, they've always been, let's throw the police at a kind of a situation which creates a problem for the police department. The reason why they have to do this is because the department, or should I say the mayor, has not allowed for a class to go in in the last couple of years. 
So there has been no turnover, or should I say, no um, influx of new corrections officers to fill in for the attrition that has taken place and for the individuals who are getting themselves destroyed. I mean, beat up and, and, and you know, sodomized and accosted in this facility by these inmates. So there's no reflux. And at the end of the day, we've got this problem. Now they're trying to find ways to fill those gaps because de Blasio doesn't want to be embarrassed where the state has to come in with the uh, National Guard. So what's the long-term play on this? Uh, you know, it, it, we need a place to put those who've been convicted of crimes or at least waiting, right. waiting to go to trial. What do we do? I mean, it's not as if, you know, we don't need a Rikers Island or we, we, we need it or we need something. What's the long-term play here? Well, the, the concerns are, and you look at the numbers, there's a 45,000 person recidivism rate you know, that takes place every year and has been for a long time. Now, the approach to the less is more and the bail reform, some of that stuff could very well help. I mean, I believe individuals who have not committed any felonies, have done misdemeanor crimes or, or whatever the case would be, no, they should not be sitting in jail. However, we do have felonies, uh, individuals who committed felonies, who are actually cutting through that loophole and getting out of jail based on the sympathy of this ultra-liberal approach. And now, mind you, I'm a Democrat. And, 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 and you got to politicize this as much as you want. But when you look at it from the standpoint, the ultra liberal movement is creating an unsafe atmosphere on these streets for all of us in New York, no matter what party you're a part of. So what's going to be? What's going to happen? Well, the borough-based jails are not going to work. I mean, the borough-based jails are only being created to accommodate at maximum, I think, 2,000, 2,500 you know, individuals. It would have you as crime continues to go up, which we're going to see it happen because this pandemic has placed us in such an economic dire strait. There are going to be individuals out here trying to make ways to feed their family or, or put money in their pockets. And unfortunately, it's going to be that constant battle between the have and have nots and the haves are going to lose. That's you, me, the middle class folks in our city that work hard. We're going to be those victims. And it, when it's said and done, we're putting them in a very, um, very serious position of our safety being violated. And those borough-based jails, as I spoke to it, they will not be able to accommodate that high recidivism rate. So now what do you do? And you're closing Rikers to say what? You're closing it. I think the attitude was we're going to close this because the conditions are bad and, and the temperament there should be changed. But you're just moving one problem, which is going to be the same problem, to another location. You're not helping anything. And then you're reducing the amount of corrections officers, which you should not be doing because we need to maximize a per ratio uh, correction officer to inmate population. Well, let me ask you a question because I, you know, I'm not really wanting to play the blame game here, but if the numbers start to go down with respect to COVID and things start to get somewhat back to normal, um, would that help the situation in terms of, you know, just crime ends up going down, hopefully. Do you see that? Or just we just have to fix this entire situation at this point? We just need more resources. What are your thoughts on that? I think that we have a lot of knee-jerk, um, political, grandstanding uh, positions being taken. Uh, I don't have a crystal ball. At the, you know, when, when we look at things, crime is up. Matter of fact, just this weekend, I'll be doing a, a whole big anti-violence um, ride out to go to various areas where high profile sh shootings have taken in the Bronx, in Queens, in Brooklyn, in Times Square. And we're going there to bring recognition to the fact that we have a problem. And the elected officials we have in office has not come up with a remedy to fix this. And albeit they have the power to do so. And it's very simple. It's economics. It's basically put the resources where they're supposed to be. Let's not waste money on these freaking bike lanes and on the Brooklyn Bridge and, and, and find monies to put up all these safety patterns and encourage people to get on bikes, which is gonna cause more accidents because most of these people don't follow the rules anyway. So now you have cars that don't follow the rules and bikes that don't follow the rules. What are you gonna get? And you still have people that cross in between the, in, in between the green. You know, cross, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just saying. No, so well, listen, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a realist and, and you see what's going on, you, you're correct. The bikers don't follow the rules and a lot of the cars don't either. That I agree. I mean, it, all you have to do is walk around the city and you see it all the time. I mean, you know, all the time. missing it. So well, listen, we're Tony, in a quagmire. We're in a serious quagmire. Well, Tony, I want to thank you for coming on. You're always a you know, strong community advocate. We really thank appreciate you. it thank here. You. I'm sure the community appreciates it. Hopefully, in the next couple of months, you'll come back and uh, give us a little bit of an update. Stay tuned. Tony Herbert for New York City Public Advocate, TonyHerbert.com. Perfect. All right, stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more right after this.
All right, welcome back to today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We're gonna be talking today with uh, Catherine Greenberg, uh, domestic workers. Catherine, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you, David? You know, there are so many domestic workers who help our city run. There are many times they're in the, in the background, the nannies, the housekeepers. Without them, we couldn't get to work, we couldn't do our jobs, yet, they don't have the same protections or they haven't had the same protections, but things are changing. Am I correct? That's right, David. And we're really excited about it at the commission, this new expansion of our law that will provide really much needed protections for domestic workers across the city. Well, where did it come from? In other words, what were there, were there complaints from, from the, from domestic workers that just somehow made it to your office? Just what, where, what was the impetus to really make this happen? So it really came from the domestic workers themselves. They've been organizing themselves and fighting for expanded rights and protections in so many areas. And that's a movement that we at the commission have been really proud to support and to collaborate on to find a way to increase these protections. You know, historically, there have been minimums for employees to have protections under the anti-discrimination laws. So only employers with four or more employees under city and state law or 15 or more employees under federal law would have the protections of the anti-discrimination law. And so we're really thrilled that domestic workers now will be able to enjoy the full protections of the city human rights law. It sounds like it was almost like a grassroots effort, you know, just nannies knowing care workers, knowing home health care aides and talking and saying, hey, you know, what about us? Why are we left out? Um, that seems or may have been the situation. Why don't you let the viewers know who specifically qualifies under the new law? Yes. So many of the workers that you mentioned, so nannies, home care workers, house cleaners, any worker who's employed in a home providing child care, elder care, companionship, housekeeping services, both full-time and part-time workers are covered. Uh, the law does exclude people who are working on a casual basis, so occasionally or regularly, and it also excludes workers who are related to the employer or to the person that they're providing care from. Well, a couple of things. First of all, in terms of casual, are there, is there an hourly requirement, you know, 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week? What does that really mean, casual? There's not a cutoff like that for hours. If someone is working on a regular basis, even if it's a couple of hours a week, but regularly, then they have protections. For example, a house cleaner who might clean someone's home once a week. Um, if someone is working maybe a couple of hours once a month on an irregular or occasional schedule, then they might not have protections. But we would encourage any worker with questions about whether they're covered to contact our agency. All right, let's talk those who may not be documented or partially documented, what's their situation with respect to this new law? Okay. So all workers have protections under the city's human rights law, um, documented, undocumented. There are even protections in the law against discrimination and harassment because of somebody's immigration or citizenship status. So a domestic worker who's paid less or called names because of their immigration status would have a claim under the city's law. All right, so let's talk, you know, let's talk discrimination and or harassment, which unfortunately is so prevalent within the homes. Um, and it used to be taboo to discuss it. They don't want to lose their job. Um, but now they're coming out from the shadows. What do they do? How do you file a claim? How do you protect yourself if you're that particular domestic worker and you've just been wronged? So this law will be coming into effect in March, on March 12th, but even before then, we would encourage workers who feel that they've experienced discrimination or harassment to contact us, um, and also employers who want to learn more about their obligations under the law. They can call us at 212-416-0197 and speak to our info line, or they can go to our website at nyc.gov forward slash report discrimination to fill out an inquiry form. We have staff that speak over 30 languages. We have free interpretation services. People should feel confident coming to us that we will be able to answer their questions. Now, my, my question to you is, you know, preparing them or protecting them later on if they want to bring either a lawsuit against an employer or make some type of claim against an insurance company if, if, for whatever the reasons may be, do you advise them in ways to protect themselves in terms of evidence for these future things? For instance, 
send the you, you know send the your your employer a, a certified letter letting them know about the harassment and follow it up in an email do you also do that in in, in terms of providing um coverage for them protection in the because you only have a certain amount of time in the law to be able to bring certain lawsuits and different things do you help them in that way as well we do provide a lot of advice and guidance to workers who are trying to learn more about their rights and also about how to prove violations of their rights mm -hmm. under the law. So workers can file with us for one year from the date of the last discriminatory act or three years in court. And our info line speaks with many, many people who have those kinds of questions. How can I prove what's happening to me? How can I document what's happening to me? How can I understand where to go and how to exercise my rights? All right, so lastly, Catherine, we don't have too much time. Somebody's watching today, um, any one of the domestic workers that are covered, and they just don't really know what to do first. They're watching this show for the first time and they say, okay, Catherine, what should I do? What do you tell them to do? I would say call us, call us 212-416. 0197. We would like to hear what you're experiencing, what you're seeing, what has happened, and we will see if we can assist. And if we can't, we will put you in the hands of someone who can. And just lastly, I know the New York City Commission on Human Rights does such great work. Anything else on the table, things coming up that we should know about? Wonderful little projects. Well, we are really excited to be looking forward to what the future has to hold. We know that our current commissioner, Carmela Malalas, who's given so much to our agency, is going to be stepping down at the end of this week. But we are excited to see who our new leader may be and the priorities and goals that they have. Our agency has done a lot in so many areas on anti-Black racism and uh, protections against sexual harassment and other types of discrimination and harassment. And so we're really looking forward to continuing to expand and to speak with members of the public about what our law has to offer. Well, Catherine Greenberg, Special Counsel at the New York City Commission to Human Rights. I want to thank you very much for being here. And hopefully, Catherine, you can come back soon. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. All right. Hang with us. Today's verdict has so much more right after this. Today's verdict. I'm your host and trial attorney, David Lesh. We have with us today Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Council Member, thanks for being here today. Thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share uh, where we are with the municipal voting rights. It's it's important. You know, it's a very important issue. Before the bill, before the municipal voting rights bill. Who was not eligible? In other words, who were the people that couldn't vote that this bill would now include? Well, it depends when, as we know, uh, unfortunately, the, our United States Constitution only allow white rich men that have land to vote in elections. And even taking, it took uh, so many struggle from women to people of color to, gather, to have the right to vote. And, and at the beginning, you know, if you're talking like 150 years ago, there was not, when they were electing local leaders, no one had to be citizens in order to vote in the local election. And the federal law already established that the state and the city are the one that had the right to decide who vote in the local election and only uh, the definition that individuals must be only citizens in order to vote for federal position is separate from what the federal law already say uh, that states and cities. 
and the cities are the one that have the right to decide who vote in the election. And in the state of New York, it, we believe that we only have a, a that there's not a ceiling when it came to who voted in the election. And that's why the lawyers for in the immigration coalition and the council members who support the bill believe that this is something that I strongly believe that this is something that we can do as a city, as all the towns they have done it in Maryland and also in Vermont. And the bill will now make it possible for those who are legal resident status, right? Legal resident status to be able to vote. I mean, we're talking maybe a million people. Am I correct? I mean, that's a lot of people. It's a million people that has not been connected with the voting rights a, 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 a opportunity that they should have. They pay taxes and we have failed when it comes to not tax section with our representations. Those individuals, many of them, they are professionals who could be DACA recipients. They could be individuals that they have working papers and they were working in Delhi, they could be working in pharmacy, they were working driving in taxis or working and supplying the supermarkets. They were first responders. And, and when we look at those individuals, they are not yet Latinos, as probably many people think. They can be New Yorkers who are Italians who are Irish, who are Poland, who are Africans that came from Mali, from Ghana, from Senegal, and who are Asian too. We're talking about individuals that they work in the media, who they have a working payment, permit to be working here in the United States, that they will have the opportunity as they pay the taxes to decide who will not be the mayor, the controller, the public advocate, the council member that will be making decisions about cleaning the streets making our streets safe, uh, improving the quality of education. But where are you getting pushback from? Uh, uh, is there, there's always a pushback somewhere. Who's pushing back and saying, you know what, this isn't fair. You're just, you're just garnering more votes for the Democratic Party, maybe more of the progressive part of the Democratic Party. Where are you getting the pushback? Look, I, I feel that, that we are New Yorkers and, and and New Yorkers are individuals that we always have a strong opinion. And I think that the debate is part of a democratic process where we live. The good thing is that, that you know, 34 council members have signed the bill. And we have a, 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 a diversity of those people. They are individuals that they include, you know, from council member Salamanca, council member Ruben Diaz, council member Fernando Cabrera, Council member Vanessa Gibson, a former council member a, a, a Andrew Coy. We have in Manhattan, we have Gil Brewer, and we have a Helen Rosenthal, a Kalina Rivera. I can say all council members from the Bronx a, are supporting this bill. I have to tell so you, most, when, of, most of those people have been on our show. I just want you to know. So, you know, they have been supportive of the community. What, why are they behind it? What's their reasoning also? Just that some of the constituents are disconnected, disenfranchised? Where I, I feel that, first of all, we have, we as, you know, as we have been able to work with important legacy from UPK for all to, you know, criminal justice reform, basic day, a, a maternity, paternity leave, a, a fast food worker right. And I think that what we have seen is that, you know, many of those brothers and sisters that we would like to give the opportunity for them to vote. Those are people that have been contributing to our city big time for so many decades. I'm one of those individuals that I has had a green card from 1983 to 2000. And during those years, I was a teacher, co-founder to a school. I was a livery taxi driver. I was a student organizer. I work in a factory. I work washing dishes. So as I have claimed, I made my contribution at the same level or more. When I had green card, as I have made it, I it after I got my citizenship in 2000. So we strongly believe and that this is a bill 
that will put New York City in the front line when it came to be the large municipality that it will be leaving a sample on how we in our nation should be able to provide the opportunity for people who pay taxes to elect their representative. That's why, you know, all those 34 council members are behind. That's why four of our president from Brooklyn Board President, we hope it's gonna be the new mayor, Ruben Diaz Jr. It, 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 Donovan Richard from Queens, it, in, in, in Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Gabe Brewer, con, city controllers, Cass Stringer, public advocate, Jomani William, the New York State NWSCP, the House of Joseph Leva, Reverend Sharpton. You know, this is a coalition of individuals that have a, a leadership position in our city, most important. The Immigration Coalition led a coalition of more than 65 groups throughout the whole city who say, we are so behind on restoring the rights of New Yorkers who pay their taxes to have a voice to elect their representatives. We're gonna leave it there. It was well said. And certainly with your own experience and what you've been through, you could see why giving those the opportunity to vote you know, as early as possible is really a very good thing. Councilman, we'd like to thank you very much for being here and hopefully you'll come back in a couple of months and give us an update. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Our pleasure. All right, well, stay with us. Today's verdict has so much more right after this. Well, that's all we have for today. I'd like to thank our three guests for joining us and of course you, the viewers for watching. If you have an issue that you would like to see on a future edition of today's verdict, feel free to email me at davidlesh at proxnet.org. Until the next time, know the issues, reach a verdict. We'll see you in two weeks.